Jason, thank you so much um, for this opportunity to present. Um, I consider it um, really a great honor. And um, I, I love sort of hearing about the history of what, what you all have done over time. Um, and to have this opportunity to help frame and, and kick off. And, and so I, I hope that I, I kind of hit the right spots. Um, so, you know, I'm going to start with this slide, not because it actually is uh, completely relevant. Um, when we're doing presentations within the Linux Foundation, we start every single meeting with this antitrust policy notice. And in many ways, my thought when I see that screen is that what I want you to understand about the Linux Foundation, about LF Energy, is that it is a pre-competitive platform. And so, you know, there are 25 million GitHub sites um, and escalate, you know, growing daily. Um, so it's this is not just about open source. Open source is a permissive intellectual property license that allows for joint investment. Um, but it's a pre-competitive platform. And so some of you are already members of the Linux Foundation and LF Energy, and uh, others we really want you to become a member and want you to understand that this is a place where natural competitors can work together and ecosystems can get built. Um, LF Energy lives inside the Linux Foundation and um, the Linux Foundation is really the world's dominant open source platform. And uh, one way of thinking about this is that, you know, you had uh, Linus Torvald who hacked a solution uh, to um, kind of proprietary software, which was a new, became the Linux kernel. It went in 30 years from a dorm room to really being the foundation of, of kind of the digital platform of the planet. Um, and uh, in every, any given time uh, at the Linux Foundation, really what we are creating is a massive amount of shared value. And uh, so there are hundreds of thousands of developers, billions of dollars of shared value. Uh, we have 420 open source projects right now and um, uh, 1,900 and growing um, members. So LF Energy takes its um, uh, it's DNA from the Linux Foundation. And uh, one way of thinking about the Linux Foundation is that it's a shared services um, environment um, that supports the adoption and diffusion, maintenance, uh, leverage development uh, for open source. And uh, there are many projects that you probably would recognize, uh, Kubernetes, uh, ONAP is the backbone of 5G. Uh, let's encrypt hundreds of millions of websites, RISC V, uh, LF Edge. Um, and these projects are the projects upon which uh, many, many companies in the world um, build their uh, dependencies. And so while we have 2,000 uh, members, um, I think that a, a lot of companies, perhaps all, actually are consuming open source. Um, and when I think about sort of the energy transition and, and how to actually accelerate the energy transition, many of these projects are going to become the building block, blocks of the future. And so there's maybe, um, you know, there, there are some software and applications that are going to be laying on top of um, uh, infrastructure that are common um, and can be shared across industries. And there are others that are actually very specific to industries. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about LF Energy. So open source is not slowing down anytime soon. Um, my background is as a diffusion. Um, that's what my PhD is in, is in innovation. So I look at adoption curves all the time and think about, well, where are we? and what are the things that we can learn from where we are. So we're really about to hit takeoff. And the implications of that are that, um, you know, and there are probably many different reasons why, but the energy transition in particular 
um, because we have to fundamentally transform our economies and the things that consume energy and the things that generate and deliver energy. Um, we are going to be generating uh, open source um, at scale. So the real question then becomes, which are the projects that really matter? Um, and that actually gets down to a very small number. Um, the Linux Foundation really seeks to accelerate the new projects um, and, in, and make those the global de facto standard. Um, so this is an, kind of another view of how we think about it. Um, really, we look at the 80-20 rule um, and this has really played itself out in, in pretty much every industry. But recently, uh, there was a scan of uh, software that's used in energy and power systems. And 100% uh, of them had open source inside. So the question is not whether we're using it. It's how do we use it? How do we use it securely? Because we're basically building supply chains and digital supply chains. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because of the executive order in the United States, which I think is probably going to drive industrial transformation with regards to supply chain security. Um, but you know, we look at an 80-20 rule and 80% is open source and 20% is proprietary. Our goal is not to cannibalize capital or destroy the businesses of the OEMs and the vendors. It's really to change floors. And what the Linux Foundation provides is leadership and support, marketing, talent and training, security, intellectual property, legal support, certification and events. So, why do people use open source? And you know, uh, Jason and I had a conversation about um, how comfortable people are with open source. And um, you know, one thing to consider that when you are making the business case for open source, there are probably multiple um, points that you want to take into consideration that are different based on where you are. Um, but open source really allows for um, innovation. Um, it allows for new business opportunities. I believe because it's a pre-competitive platform or at least the Linux Foundation is, it really allows for us to commoditize the lower parts of the stack so that they're shared, it kind of like building a road. You know, We wouldn't all wanna create our own roads. We wanna create a common road. So we wanna create common plumbing common infrastructure, and then we wanna be able to provide value on top of it. So kind of, you know, the destinations of where a road takes you or the buildings that a plumbing is in. And so that's one way to really think about it. Um, another way to think about it, which I think is critical because of the amount of security breaches with proprietary software that we have um, actually uh, seen is that it is an opportunity to get all eyes um, on software and to really be able to ensure that there's a software bill of materials that ships with every software and that there's attestation for your supply chain, your digital supply chain. Um, many, many, many of you probably consume software. The question then becomes, are you willing to contribute? And the moving from being a consumer to a contributor to open source really is a shift in how people think about the work that they're doing. Um, I, I'm a gardener. Um, and so what I understand is that if you do not put back into the garden and take care of the soil and ensure that uh, the soil is healthy, um, then it really makes it very difficult to grow. Um, so uh, there's a, while uh, folks are free to contribute um, and they don't have to, um, I think that the better path forward is to learn how to build open source program offices and learn how to contribute um, back upstream. So I'm gonna switch. Um, if there are any questions that are specifically related to open source, I'm happy to take them. What I'm gonna do now is kind of switch to LA Energy. And when I was thinking about and listening to Jason, um, because LF Energy was really founded by transmission system operators in Europe, um, RTE was our founding member. 
Um, and then at the distribution level, um, Oleander, which is the Dutch, um, uh, uh, largest Dutch distribution system operator. Um, because our roots in, are in Europe, we've mostly focused really at the transmission and the distribution level. We've had some generation engage. Um, but I think that um, when I see sort of the relationship between LF Energy and where LF Energy and open source could be supportive of the wind industry, it's the recognition that it, you are creating electrons and we want to be able to get those electrons onto the grid and to begin to uh, build new um, uh, business processes, um, new ways of thinking about load shifting with regards to data centers or whatever that it, that enables you to get your electrons onto the grid, onto the power system. And, uh, and so in that way, I really invite you to come uh, to LF Energy. And I think that there are things that we're working on um, that we can work on together. Um, when we first started the project, um, you know, uh, well, I'll get to that. So this is really at the heart of what it is that we're doing. Um, power systems lead in uh, decarbonization and, and right behind that is transportation and, and buildings. And that really represents 75% of the uh, CO2 emissions that we need to remove um, from the atmosphere. So those are our marching orders. Um, power systems lead and generation, the ability to get the electrons from a renewable source, um, from a clean source um, into our power networks is um, critical in terms of being able to on onboard transportation, buildings, trucks, and then uh, farther down uh, the, the line in terms of agriculture, aviation, shipping, steel, cement, et cetera. Um, so, and before I kind of, I, I, I want to talk just for a moment about um, what, what motivates us. And uh, this question was a question that emerged for me um, kind of in one of those walks where, uh, you know, you, something kind of just explodes in your head. And, and in it, my unborn grandchildren, this is about 15 years ago, asked me, what did I do during the Great Transition? And I, I really didn't know what the great transition was, but you know what they were referring to is the time that we're in right now. And the idea of saying nothing, but I was worried, um, didn't work for me. So I, I went and I got a PhD in uh, innovation and looking at how the future emerges. And, um, and I feel that all of us really have to figure out what is it that is animating us in terms of moving forward, because this journey is going to be um, extremely rewarding, but also really challenging, because there are a lot of vested interests that we're going to have to fight against. Um, these are my grandchildren now, um, and I recognize that when they grow up, they are probably never going to put um, fossil fuel into a car, and in fact, they may never own a car. Um, so the world that they're inheriting is really quite different. <clears throat> so the grand challenge is really to design energy and power systems um, for the future, as if creating the conditions for our grandchildren's children to thrive. And my guess is, is that all of you recognize that. Um, the reason why I put this forward is that there is a level of inertia that is so deeply embedded in the systems that we're trying to transform that I believe that it's really important that we have to align our moral compasses so that we can actually be successful. Um, we started LF Energy with six projects and now we have 12. Um, you can go to the website, you can find out all kinds of things about the projects. HIFI is a microgrid, Fledge Power is a multi-protocol gateway, Swanio is the beginning of a microservices SCADA system. Grid Exchange Fabric is an IoT platform. Operator Fabric is a universal UI. Open Leader is demand response. Possible is power system modeling. CPAP and Compass are related to um, uh, digital substations and open EE meter um, is uh, for deferred energy. And REAPS is a platform for building uh, power system applications. Um, we started and everybody was 
all the projects were very siloed. And what's happening now as we mature, and I, I, I love the idea of maturity models, um, is that um, as we have matured, that actually the collaboration and cooperation across the projects has gotten stronger. Um, security is at the core of what we do. Um, our projects are all in the process of being badged. Um, if you go to our website, you can also get to our wiki and you can see the process and that every single one of our projects has a software bill of materials. And so you can go to the GitHub, you can see the scanning and you can see what's inside. Um, and, uh, and we believe that uh, SBOMS um, and so supply chain security is going to be the most important transformation in the next 12 months um, that will, in the end, um, really drive um, digital transformation. Um, we are an actively emerging community. Um, you can also go to the Linux Foundation website and there's a platform called LXF. Um, this is part of what is the difference between a GitHub and what is the difference between that and what happens within the Linux Foundation. We have a lot of tools within the Linux Foundation for actually, um, you know, managing projects. And so, you know, with this, we're able to see how many contributors, what kind of contribution, how co many lines of code. And these things actually enable us to drill down to each project. And as they say, you cannot, um, uh, you know, you cannot uh, improve what it is that you don't measure. And so we're very big on uh, measurement and this uh, helps us to see that. These are our members. Um, quite a few of you already are members and I really would love to have the rest of you become members as well. Um, so we're building a grid that's beyond our ability to intellectually manage. And um, data and AI, is going to drive the transformation um, as you guys have understood. And whether it's at the generation, the transmission, the consumption, storage, um, market design and operation, AI and data is going to be at the heart of all of it. Um, and the reason why is because what we're essentially doing is networking electrons. Now, all of us know that you cannot literally network an electron, an electron needs a surface uh, to move over. But what we are networking is the metadata about electrons. Uh, all of that is going to create a tsunami of data. And I think um, this is really what it's going to look like. It, it's going to be this unbelievable um, kind of tsunami of data coming at us. Um, and the tsunami of data also has another feature, which is that it's going to add more demand for electricity worldwide. And so the thing that we're using to help solve the problem and transition is also creating more demand in our energy. But it is also enabling us to really move towards radical energy efficiency. So because of that, really thinking about the stack, uh, the LF energy stack and, and how we're thinking about this, regardless of whether uh, you're designing a system that's within LF Energy or you're somewhere else, is that, you know, there's the application catalog that lies on top of it, which is business intelligence. And that's kind of, um, you know, uh, that's uh, all sorts of applications. In the middle is really the data and services. And at the edge is um, really the infrastructure and, and the bare metal. And so you all are probably designing systems that are very similar to this, where you've got hardware out in the field, sensors, um, you're bringing that data in, you need to put it into a rich environment in order to be able to see it. Some of that is SCADA data, and some of it is telemetry, and some of it is data that is shared between parties, and some of it, uh, all of it has to be actually applied through business intelligence. Um, this is how we see our platform right now. Um, we see at the edge um, that there's no one edge. There are many edges. Um, we are, to the best of our ability, using um, the projects and the code from LF Edge. Um, we, uh, I don't really like reinventing things, and I also don't like driving around lost um, unless that's my goal, is to be lost. So... Um, in this case, what we're really trying to do is 
build on top of other industrial um, environments, creating uh, real-time data environments, some to be shared, some of the in um, kind of data services and network model managers, and then a, a set of applications on top. And in that way, I think that there are many applications that we could host um, or that we could support um, if, if there was a desire and a need to make some of the software that you all are working with the de facto standard. Um, from a governance perspective, just to kind of finish up, you know, at the heart of the Linux Foundation and LF Energy is governance. That's the secret sauce. Having a project on a GitHub, you can pull it down, but you can't really govern how it grows over time. Um, so we have uh, LF Energy is the funding model. Linux Foundation is software and protects the trademarks and patents that are in the software for uh, access so that leverage development works and your investment doesn't get lost. Um, and then we have a governing board and a technical advisory committee. Governing board is finance and the TAC is where all our projects roll up. Um, if you have a project that you're interested in, all of this is very visible on the website. Um, you really can come in. You can either do it as a special interest group or a working group on WEND, let's say, um, that lived inside of LF Energy or was jointly uh, sponsored by IEA and LF Energy, um, submit a project proposal. It goes to the TAC, um, then it goes to the governing board and it comes in. Um, and, and this is basically what our life cycle looks like. Um, and, you know, in closing, um, this is was an avatar that I kind of developed at the end of last year, and it was this feeling of the backpack just kept getting heavier and heavier, and the mountain kept getting steeper and steeper. Um, so we are in this for the long term, and um, I think that in some ways we will be faced periodically with the fog of war, whether it's pandemics, whether it's social upheaval. Um, whether it's conflict, yet we have to keep going. Um, and so that's my encouragement to everyone is to recognize we're in it for the long term. Um, think about your grandchildren, think about your great grandchildren, really use them uh, to help you keep going and not be discouraged, be kind and smart. And um, that's really what's in front of us. Um, get connected, um, follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, we have mailing lists for everything. Uh, you can find all our projects on the GitHub and our wiki is um, and calendar are pretty up to date. Um, and so you can get access and see where those meetings are and those tags are. That's my contact information. And I am happy to have any of you reach out at any time. Excellent, thank you. We got some uh, <clears throat> some applause from the audience there. Um, <clears throat> so I want to uh, I want to shift into the kind of Q and A section, and again, um, encourage uh, all of our uh, attendees to drop questions in the chat, and we'll uh, we'll cover them. Um, <clears throat> we'll start with uh, Philip Totaro's comment, I guess, and maybe we can turn this into a question, but. Um, need to discuss slash clarify how companies can monetize the commercial value of their data uh, and intellectual capital in an open source environment. Um, many com companies in this industry still want to own the infrastructure, uh, such as data lakes, uh, content distribution channels, et cetera, rather than have a more collaborative approach. Um, so maybe a couple of things to unpack there. <clears throat> One is, how have you seen this play out maybe in other industries? Um, where they're trying to, you know, own the infrastructure in a similar way, um, and and how do we? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. How do we provide a pathway to, you know, revenue and profitability for these companies while collaborating? What is it? What does that look like? So, uh, I'll I'll just take a page from my personal history. Um, I started building internet applications and right when you could make a query to Netscape 2, so a long time ago. And at that time, um, there were proliferation of software. 
Um, in particular, there was a proliferation of software around uh, content management, yeah. data management, um, and all kinds of tools uh, that became really foundational for the internet. Those things became commodities. And so you can now put up a website and manage a website, you know, with a click of a few buttons, um, you know, and so there are going to be things that are going to get commodified. And so when you think about um, your business and how you are either consuming and providing value to the market, I think particularly in the software space, it's really important to recognize that if you look at the history of scaling software um, and what has happened in telecommunications, what's happening on automotive, um, what's happening in finance, um, there is a constant trend towards commodification of the lower stack uh, level. Um, with regards to infrastructure, uh, so that's kind of the code and the applications. And so I, I often see, uh, for instance, you know, the idea that, you know, people are going to own markets or they're going to own the software that's going to be, um, you know, microgrids or that's going to be kind of the next infrastructure of our power systems. Um, I, I would just suggest that you want to move very slowly in that because um, and, and to really think with a, you know, cold view whether um, that actually is going to grow into something. Um, you know, I think that that with regards to infrastructure and data hosting and, you know, the hyperscaling businesses, I don't think they're going away. Um, and um, I think that there are plenty of, you know, academic environments and places where you can host um, inexpensive content and infrastructure. Um, but we actually need very secure infrastructure in order to be able to make this transition. So it's going to be you know, you're going to have to weigh what the adoption and diffusion pathway is going to be for technology um, and also to be able to really look at can we work on the shared commodity pieces and then build value on top. Um, the algorithms, what we do with content, um, the kind of strategic insight and visibility, those things are not going to go away. Um, and that those are the levels that I would invest in. Oh, hope, I hope, Philip, that that was a, uh, a detailed enough answer. Um, I think I'm going to have to like rewatch that one a few times just to decode it. Um, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> no, sorry. Really I should say. Um, but uh, a lot uh, of text there. Um, so I want to I want to ask a question. Um, so you you mentioned kind of tending the garden. Um, yes. And I think this is one of the challenges that exist in open source in general, right? And so maybe you can opine on what are the successful contribution models we've seen, um, whether it's something like you know Linux Foundation or NumFocus. Um, how do we actually catalyze that change in thinking, especially maybe in a, in a space where it's newer, such as wind? Um, how do we encourage uh, people to kind of make that change, people and businesses to make that change. Um, you know, is it is it logistical pieces like uh, having, you know, negotiating that when you start your job? Um, you know, we've, we're running an open source project and we've seen some of that. Um, you know, is it these kind of like larger funding foundation models? Like what, what would you advise folks in the wind industry to be aware of in terms of like, you know, tangible things that we can do to contribute back to the community? Um, you know, I, I would love to see a, a WEND project. Um, my, my sense is that, um, that there's a tremendous amount of optimization that has occurred um, in, in a variety of parts in the industry. The, the biggest challenge yet, and if I'm you know, uh, if, if I'm not getting it right, tell me, but the, the, the biggest challenge is being able to get those electrons on and moved around in a way um, that really um, values the investment of, of, you know, the wind infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, there are parts of your life cycle, whether it's 
the siting parts, um, it's the uptake parts, it's the optimization parts, um, it's how, you know, kind of getting the electrons to market parts. Um, those are things that would benefit the wind industry, um, not necessarily in an individual um, contributor sense, but in a sense of that there's infrastructure, there's, and I don't mean infrastructure like cloud infrastructure, but there necessarily, but um, there's like a super highway that needs to get built um, that is as formidable and safe and secure. And security would be one of the principal ways that I would really want to maybe ask you all to consider to collaborate on is, you know, we're, um, we're only as safe, you know, if, if the wind industry, if there's some big hacking that takes place with one of you, it's going to contaminate all of you. And so it's really from a perspective of, you know, we have to get this right and we have to recognize that we're creating a digital supply chain, data, data provenance, knowing that your data is good data um, it's not, you know, that there aren't problems with the data so that you actually can assess the value of what it is that you're looking at. Those are the kinds of things that um, I think are possible to work on together. Um, and then, um, so that's, that's what I would like to see. And in telecommunications, that's exactly what they did. Um, you know, initially, I think that there was a misunderstanding about uh, the importance of leaving part of the stack um, so that OEMs and vendors and suppliers have kind of a commercialization pathway. Because uh, what we're doing is creating a new economic foundation um, that will allow us to actually leave fossil fuel as, you know, the dominant industry that has driven um, so much of wealth transformation on the planet. And I think, you know, people have said it before, digital and you know, data is the new oil. So whatever it is that we're doing with data, we have to figure out how to get it out into the world and make it actionable and usable. And some of that needs to be open source and done in collaboration. I don't know if that answers, but um, hopefully. Yeah, no, I think that that is really helpful. <clears throat> um, and so just to kind of reflect that back, you know, one of the, I guess, main areas for collaboration is on the security side, the kind of thinking of it as this digital supply chain where you're really creating the, the kind of universal infrastructure that will be needed for security, but also kind of efficiency of the system. Um, and, I, and I really like that statement, creating a new economic foundation um, and, and making space for uh, you know, OEMs and other people to kind of build on top of that common infrastructure. So um, it's great. Uh, I had one question. So there's this, you know, going down that security piece a little bit further. Um, you you had a slide on the core infrastructure badging. I think it's the CII badging. Can you elaborate a little bit on what that is and what that what that looks like? So uh, if you go to the Linux Foundation or if you do some kind of, are you still talking? I'm sorry. No. Okay, I lost, I lost your volume. Um, so if you do some kind of a search and you look for core infrastructure initiative, CII is now part of the open SSF, which is the open source Security Foundation, and it's headed up by a, a guy named David Wheeler, who comes from the Department of Defense. Um, and David has been a tremendous support um, to LF Energy as a, one of the smaller, I mean, we're a small and mighty foundation, and I think one day we'll be one of the largest foundations at, at the LF. Um, but, you know, I feel like that um, my job is to really figure out how to harvest what others have done. So CII is a process that um, you go through in order to ensure, um, you know, it's a repeatable process um, and you badge um, that your project is secure, that you've addressed um, particular issues. Um, and 
And then there's also SPDX, which is the SBOM, the, um, the uh, Software Bill of Materials. So we're looking at those together, we're, but we are also looking at a couple of other different things. Um, we're looking at an attestation pro project um, that Unisys is going to contribute. Um, there's actually a proof of concept with NTIA and uh, Idaho National Labs and Intel and Dell and a few others um, to actually do a proof of concept about a um, software bill of materials for energy. Um, and it's really a recognition of attestation channels. Um, this is a, you know, the technology in some ways is really simple. I, I think this is a broader social transformation effort. And because the Biden administration um, released their, you know, executive order on supply chain and cybersecurity last week with regards to the cloud, with regards to uh, S-bombs, this requirement for attestation is going to become universal. And, and so, you know, it's not going to happen tomorrow, um, but I really want all of you to recognize we are in a global process. There's not going to be one process for Europe and one process for the United States and another process for India and a third one for China. And it, it's just, there's no way that the OEMs and the vendors can support that. So there, and because data moves all over the place, we have to get this right. Um, and so it is kind of an industrial transformation. And I think it's the gateway we cannot even get to the kind of distributed energy future that we imagine if we don't do this right to begin with. So um, in that way, I think security cannot be um, a competitive differentiator, like we're secure and we don't really care about that because I think with reputational identity, um, you know, it's like if there's some big takedown of the grid, um, via some kind of a wind farm, it's going to affect everybody. It's going to affect all of um, So that's, that's at that level. Um, at, at the other level, in terms of attestation, I think of I think eventually we are going to have to have some sort of attestation about uh, the carbon, um, like the, the carbon intensity of every electron um, that you put onto the grid. And, and so this is another project that I think you guys could really be driving, which is, you know, if, you're, if your electrons are greener and more neutral and, you know, have greater persistence and et, et cetera, um, that that becomes a marketplace advantage. Um, and you can't do that one, uh, you know, one environment at a time. You have to do that all together. Um, and it becomes an industry objective to be able to provide that kind of neutrality, uh, the kind of attestation of the value of the electron. And eventually, um, you know, I've been working with Microsoft and trying to begin a, uh, uh, a project between Microsoft and Google and a number of other um, infrastructure providers um, about, uh, you know, being able to visualize what the carbon intensity of, of an, a grid is and uh, the locational marginal value. In other words, if I place my data center here, what is the impact, you know, how carbon neutral is it? Uh, or if I put it here, how, you know, carbon intense is it? Um, and those are the kinds of things that we can do together um, and that don't necessarily produce a differentiation. They just ensure that we kind of raise all boats up. They ensure, they basically they ensure a functional marketplace for something like carbon. Yeah, yeah and, and that it's leading in the direction you want it to go, which is that the value of your electrons, I mean, are, are just, you know, the best greenest electrons on the planet, um, and the, and that you run your operations like that, um, and and you know you may, it's hard to see today, but it's obvious that it's coming. 
Excellent. And, just and that's the kind of project of just to finish, that's the kind of project that the wind industry at the generation level really needs to work with the transmission level at. And then the large commercial and industrial. It's like, so, so right there you have three completely different stakeholder groups that need to come together to work together. And the same thing would be true in the siting of infrastructure with regards to transportation. Um, you know, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to completely redo that. So that means that wind needs to work with them, with the transmission, with the, you know, infrastructure uh, for charging. And again, that's another area. It's like, so you want to look for these areas where people can't do things together. They have to do things together. They can't do them separately. And where there are multiple stakeholders where you need governance in order to ensure that it's fair and that it works well. Yeah. Wow. Very, very interesting. Um, so we have just a minute left. Uh, I want to offer you any final thoughts um, before our before our break. Um, you know, I think that. Um, so one of the scholars that I used for my PhD is a guy named Ilya Prigogine, and Ilya was a he was a chemist who actually. Uh, won a Nobel in um, dissipative systems. And as he, in other words, when things collapse, and I was studying him um, because he was really, at the latter part of his career, he was really interested in how the future emerges. And um, when he was in his late 80s, he was in a conference and he was asked, do you believe in a unifying theory of the universe? And his answer is something that I think about all the time and that I offer kind of as a takeaway for you all, which is that um, he didn't know if there was a, you know, a unified theory, but what he believed was that the laws of the universe have um, built on top of themselves over billions of years, and that we cannot create systems that uh, are in conflict with the laws of the universe. And I believe that while we have gotten an enormous amount from fossil fuel in terms of accelerating our capacity as a species um, to be able to create life and value and meaning and art and families and communities and all of those things, um, what we didn't really look at were externalities. And so, you know, when I say that the grand challenge is to really think, how do we create a system for our grandchildren's children to thrive? I really mean it. Um, and part of that is making sure that we really attend to the externalities of what we're creating. And I don't know enough about your industry to know where your externalities are. Um, but I just, I, I hope as a community that's one of the things that you would explore is, is just to always keep an eye open about, you know, where are the externalities, where are the unintended consequences, um, so that we don't really have the Facebook effect, which is we go all in on something and then discover, oh, my God, <laughs> it's undermining democracy. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, very sage words. So, um Thank you. I hope you will all join me giving a round of applause for Shuli. Um, Thank tremendous you all. Talk. And I really, you know, I love the vision and I love the, uh, uh, I love the inspiring words. So thank you so much. And, you know, on the point of like learning more about the wind industry, I encourage you to, you know, join for the rest of our sessions. There's lots of activities uh, kind of thinking about, you know, circular economies and uh, things like that. So if you want to learn more, happy to share. I just really want to thank you for what you're doing. Excellent. Well, Thanks, thank everyone. Bye. Thanks, Julie. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.